Hi, my name is Neil Apana. I'm a specialist gynaecologist in Hamilton in New Zealand. Welcome to my series of educational videos in gynaecology. Today we're going to talk about polycystic ovarian disease. Before watching this video, I would suggest you watch our video on the normal menstrual cycle. What are polycystic ovaries? The condition should really be called polyfollicular disease because the ovaries have a number of follicles in them rather than big cysts. Polycystic ovary syndrome, polycystic ovarian disease, or stain Leventhal syndrome are a spectrum of the same condition that affects some or all of the following. Menstrual cycle, fertility, appearance, cardiovascular system, and hormones. The symptoms and signs of polycystic ovarian syndrome, called PCOS, often begin soon after a woman first begins having periods, called the menarch. In some cases, PCOS develops later during the reproductive years, for instance, in response to substantial weight gain. 5-10% to of women may have the disease and may occur as young as 11. What happens in a cycle with PCOS? Before watching this, I would suggest you view our video on what happens in a normal menstrual cycle, which will give you a better understanding of the differences. In polycystic ovaries, FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone, stimulates these multiple follicles. Instead of a few follicles producing estrogen, all these follicles produce estrogen. The estrogen levels therefore rise very quickly and triggers the LH luteinizing hormone release, even though none of the follicles may be ready for ovulation. The LH is unable to stimulate ovulation, and in this case causes these follicles to produce male hormone and male hormone derivatives, which contribute to some of the male hormone effects associated with PCOS. These male hormones further inhibit ovulation, therefore leading to a vicious cycle. What causes PCOS? Insulin resistance, low-grade inflammation, or maybe hereditary or genetic. Insulin resistance. Research has shown that PCOS is a disease related to insulin resistance. Insulin is a hormone produced by the pancreas, which amongst many things controls the balance of glucose in the blood. Many women with PCOS have too much insulin in their bodies because they have problems using it. If you have insulin resistance, your ability to use insulin effectively is impaired, and your pancreas has to secrete more insulin to make glucose available to the cells. Excess insulin might also affect the ovaries by increasing androgen production, which may interfere with the ovaries' ability to ovulate. Low-grade inflammation Your body's white cells produce substances to fight infection in a response called inflammation. Research has shown that women with PCOS have low-grade inflammation and that this type of low-grade inflammation stimulates polycystic ovaries to produce androgens hereditary or genetic. If your mother or your sister has PCOS, you might have a greater chance of having it too. Researchers are also looking into the possibility that certain genes are linked to PCOS. So what effect does this have on the uterus? Generally, estrogen just builds up the lining of the uterus. With PCOS, the lining continues to build up until it outstrips its blood supply. You may then have a period. This can happen in such a regular way that is every four or six weeks, such that some people think they might be ovulating normally. In some women, however, the testosterone inhibits ovulation so much that there is no build-up at all of the endometrium, and in this case, you may not have a period at all. How do we diagnose PCOS? There is a large discrepancy of how to diagnose polycystic ovaries in the literature. I firmly believe that the disease manifests itself differently in different women, where some people have very little symptoms, others have a few, and yet others have the full-blown disease. Some academics go to great lengths to distinguish between polycystic ovaries and polycystic ovarian syndrome, but as my management is the same, I don't place any emphasis on this. My approach is the following. I take a medical history, I do an examination, I perform an ultrasound, and then I arrange for blood tests. Medical history. I take a full medical history including asking about weight changes, drugs, male hormone related symptoms, family plans, etc. 
Treatment goals will be decided on by your symptoms, whether or not you want to become pregnant, and lowering your chances of getting heart disease and diabetes. Examination. And then perform an examination including your BMI, which is body mass index, and will check for acne, abnormal hair distribution, etc. If this is your first consultation with me, I will usually perform a pelvic exam and take smears and swabs, if you have not had that done recently. Ultrasound. I will also perform a transvaginal ultrasound at this examination, which usually demonstrates polycystic ovaries. Blood tests. I will then arrange to perform a hormone profile weekly over a period of six weeks. If you are having regular periods, I will get you to do further hormones between day two or day five. Or if you aren't having regular periods, we will do this twice, at least three weeks apart. I'll go into more depth about this later. So how do we manage polycystic ovaries? Unfortunately, if you have polycystic ovaries, you have this for life, and we aim to manage this the best we can. I'd see polycystic ovaries very much dependent on your symptoms. For the overall treatment of PCOS, metformin is the ideal management. Metformin, a treatment for diabetes, is a drug which makes you more sensitive to the insulin, and therefore can allow you to get back on an even keel. This only works whilst you are on metformin. Metformin needs to be taken in fairly high doses and nausea, abdominal cramps, and diarrhea are common. Other anti-diabetic medications are also being trialed. A practical approach to management is to treat just the presenting symptoms. So just what are the symptoms of polycystic ovarian disease? Abnormal uterine bleeding, anovulation, miscarriage, male hormone effects including acne, excessive hair growth, weight gain, problems with ovulation, and amenorrhea, which means no periods. Weight issues in general. Anxiety, depression, and sleep apnea may occur. There may be problems in pregnancy, which include miscarriages, gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced blood pressure, and premature delivery. Management, of course, has to be individualized as some women have one and some women have many of the symptoms described above. Abnormal uterine bleeding. If fertility is not desired, then this can be controlled by either using an oral contraceptive pill, progesterone only, or the marina. The estrogen builds up the lining of the uterus, and the pill, progesterone, or the marina provides the progesterone necessary to counteract this. Where there are male hormone effects as well, a pill with an anti-male hormone called Suprotro may be used, example Diane, Estelle, or Jeanette. Keep in mind that your menstrual cycle will become abnormal again if the pill is stopped. Anovulation or fertility issues. Anovulation may be managed with drugs to induce ovulation. This includes clomiphene or injectable hormones to stimulate the ovaries. Weight loss also helps. Multiple pregnancies with their own set of problems are more common in women with PCOS, as clomiphene cannot selectively get one or two follicles to ovulate, so a number of them can grow to ovulatory size. These patients also have a higher risk of developing ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, and this needs to be watched for. Metformin taken with clomiphene may be tried if clomiphene alone fails. The combination may also help women with PCOS ovulate on lower doses of medication. Assisted conception methods, that is IVF and IUI, may also be used. Miscarriage It is thought that miscarriages are related to a high LH level. In women with high LH levels, ovarian drilling is advised. Metformin may also be used to drop these levels, as does weight loss. Male hormone effects Pills containing saprotron acetate or saprotron acetate itself or a diuretic called spironolactone can all be used to control male hormone effects. This should not be used if a patient is trying to conceive. Electrolysis or IPL can be used for abnormal hair growth. Anti-acne medication may also help, but are also contraindicated when contemplating pregnancy. Weight issues. Lifestyle modification can help any of the symptoms of PCOS, and weight loss certainly helps all the symptoms. Modifying lifestyle by diet and exercise has been shown to be extremely helpful. Often patients who have struggled to lose weight find they lose weight a lot easier whilst they are on metformin. Limiting processed foods and food with added sugars aimed at weight loss is the aim of this. 
Even a 10% loss in body weight can restore a normal period and make a cycle more regular. Anxiety, depression and sleep apnea. These can be managed by counselling and appropriate drugs. I tend not to manage these myself but involve GPs in ongoing management for them. Problems in pregnancy. I have already discussed miscarriage above. Patients with PCOS do not necessarily need specialist management in pregnancy, but their primary caregivers should be very aware that they are at higher risk of gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced high blood pressure called preeclampsia, and premature delivery, and refer to a specialist appropriately. Babies born to women with PCOS have a higher risk of spending time in a neonatal intensive care unit. Most of the time, these problems occur in multiple birth pregnancies, that is, twins or triplets, which may be as a result of clomiphene use in pregnancy. Researchers are now studying whether the diabetes medicine metformin can prevent or reduce the chances of having problems while pregnant. Metformin also lowers male hormone levels and limits weight gain in women who are obese when they get pregnant. Endometrial cancer Women with PCOS are also at risk for endometrial cancer. Irregular menstrual periods and lack of ovulation cause women to produce the hormone estrogen, but not the hormone progesterone. Progesterone causes the lining of the womb to shed each month as a menstrual period. Without progesterone, the endometrium becomes thick, which can cause heavy or irregular bleeding. Over time, this can lead to endometrial hyperplasia, when the lining grows too much, and eventually cancer. Surgery Ovarian drilling is a surgery that may increase the chance of ovulation. It's sometimes used when a woman does not respond to fertility medications or has recurrent miscarriages with very high LH levels. It is done via laparoscopy and you can see a video on laparoscopies on our website. I puncture the ovary with a small needle called a coarse needle which carries an electric current and destroys a small portion of the ovary. This procedure carries a risk of developing scar tissue on the ovary. This surgery can lower male hormone levels and help with ovulation but these effects may only last a few months. Other options include bariatric surgery. This is surgery for weight loss. This is really indicated if you have a BMI of more than 40 or a BMI of between 35 and 40 with an obesity-related disease. Drugs. The drug troglitazone was shown to help women with PCOS, but it was taken off the market because it caused liver problems. In patients who haven't been able to tolerate metformin, newer drugs from the same family as troglitazone are now being trialed. Other health problems associated with PCOS. More than 50% of women with PCOS will have diabetes or pre-diabetes, that is, impaired glucose tolerance, before the age of 40. The risk of heart attack is 4 to 7 times higher in women with PCOS than women of the same age without PCOS. Women with PCOS are at greater risk of having high blood pressure. Women with PCOS have high levels of LDL, the bad cholesterol, and low levels of HDL, good cholesterol. Women with PCOS can develop sleep apnea. This is when breathing stops for short periods of time during sleep. This could lead to generalized tiredness and exhaustion. Women with PCOS may also develop anxiety and depression. Disclaimer. Without having examined you personally, it is impossible for me to make a diagnosis or advise treatment. All information provided here is generalized and for educational purposes only, and decisions based on this should not be made without consulting your own medical professional. I assume no responsibility for you taking advice rendered here without me having had a physical consultation with you. I assume no responsibility for you following advice rendered here without me having had a physical consultation with you.